Well, interns, here we go again. <laughs> Another field trip to the Museum of Human Hospitality, where we'll examine several infamous punishments from an in-depth medical perspective. But before we get into the nitty gritty, please note, all depictions of trauma in this video are carefully contextualized within a lesson on human anatomy in accordance with YouTube's community guidelines. Whether you know this device as the braking wheel, the Catherine wheel, or just the wheel, it is an effective means of turning one's life around. Only just in the direction that nobody wants to go. In addition to being made of hefty wood, these wheels were outfitted with a metal rim, though sometimes they would be modified so that they could inflict further damage. What with metal spikes, studs, and other upgrades of that nature. Side note. I'd like to thank the infographics show here on YouTube, whose illustrations really helped round out today's lesson. The grim subject matter is a lot less daunting when presented in a playful animated style. These massive wheels would then be dropped on convicts all over their body, breaking bones upon impact. Thus begins the co-option of one of history's most useful inventions for the purpose of capital punishment. The dropping of the wheel on the restrained prisoner is only the first of several acts involved in this form of execution. Here, the goal is agonizing mutilation of the body, not death. Before this occurs, spikes may be placed underneath the victim to increase their suffering. Oh, Lord. Another approach was to tie a person to the wheel and hit his or her limbs with iron hammers or bars while the wheel was rotated. And in other variations, a prisoner might be tied to a large wheel and bludgeoned with blunt instruments. No matter which method the executioners choose, you could kiss your long bones goodbye. Make sure that while you're making out, you take periodic breaks. Maybe slow it down a little bit, caress the face. These bones are so named because they are, well, long. They're like the support beams of our skeleton, and they help our extremities retain their lengthy shape. We're talking about femur, tibia, and fibula in the legs, and the humerus, ulna, and radius in the arm. Before executioners can proceed to the next step in the act of execution, these must be, say it with me, Comminuted. These are my favorite type of videos. I love breaking bones. Breaking bones is the best. In medicine, we use the term comminution to describe a fracture in which the bone is splintered or crushed into numerous pieces. Bone dust, if you will. No bones about it. Skelly's gone. Okay. Dust may be a little bit hyperbolic, but you get the idea. Unfortunately, our extremities make excellent targets for non-fatal blunt force trauma. It is entirely possible to break every long bone in the body without even puncturing or tearing the skin, thus minimizing potential blood loss and a myriad of problems that that would bring. It's just the torturer, the wheel, and or blunt object of choice, and the millions of nerve endings that are distributed throughout the arms and legs in their skin, muscles, and even bones, well, Kinda. Bones themselves do not contain a significant density of nerve endings. Instead, the periosteum, a dense connective tissue membrane that covers the outer surface of bones, contains blood vessels and nerves that are responsible for supplying nutrients to the bone and transmitting pain signals in case of injury to the bone's outer layer or the surrounding tissues. Dr. Sarah Nancini and Dr. Jason J. Ivanusik wrote in a 2016 article entitled The Physiology of Bone Pain that because the periosteum lines hard cortical bone, sensory nerve endings within it are easily compressed by relatively low threshold mechanical stimuli compared to endings in more compliant tissues such as skin, which translates roughly to bones don't like getting hit with blunt objects. <laughs> Go figure. Bone breaking was only the beginning. Following step one, bodies were typically threaded through the spokes of another wheel. Long bones that effectively retain their shape don't exactly thread through spokes very effectively. While this would be difficult to do with a normal person, it was much easier once their limbs were broken. While the brain doesn't have a set limit for how much pain it can feel, it can release natural chemicals to help reduce pain in response to acute trauma. Likewise, the physical exhaustion experienced by these prisoners would leave the body and mind less alert, reducing their ability to focus on or respond to pain sensations. But endorphins and exhaustion are no consolation, and for those sentenced to death on the wheel, vasovagal syncope is the best one can hope for, short of divine intervention. That is to say, hopefully the pain will be so extreme that it would cause them to faint. 
In extreme conditions, the body's autonomic nervous system can trigger a vasovagal response, which causes a sudden drop in blood pressure and a slowing of the heart. As a result, blood vessels widen, reducing blood flow to the brain. This decrease in oxygen and nutrients reaching the brain can lead to a loss of consciousness or fainting. Unfortunately, for those who retain consciousness, the experience continues to get worse. The wheel was then attached to a pole and displayed for all to see. Some would be cut apart or strangled, finally, though painfully, in their suffering. Ah, humanity. Just when I thought I was losing hope. Hey honey, do you want to take the kids down to the park to check out the people on the wheel? Those left on the wheel to rot would die due to dehydration within two to three excruciating days. Since the body requires water for numerous vital functions, regulating body temperature, transporting nutrients, and removing waste products, dehydration eventually leads to organ failure, among other life-threatening conditions. Obviously, these torturers specialized in adding insult <laughs> to injury. Others would be placed above a blazing fire or alternatively thrown directly in one. It was even possible for the individual to be hung while on the wheel. Oh goody, more options. So what I've learned so far is that if your crime was severe enough to warrant death on the wheel, all you can really do is pray. If they somehow became disengaged or if the wheel in some way failed to do its job. In these circumstances, it was seen as divine intervention. Unfortunately, divine interventions such as these proved few and far between. Interns, hold on to your seats. We're really only just getting started. Today, we're going to be traveling back in time and learning about the Oubliette, a medieval torture of unspeakable horror. Today, we're talking about the Oubliette. That's right, with the help of the incredibly knowledgeable Medieval Madness YouTube channel, we are going to explore the Oubliette. The dungeon of my nightmares. The Oubliette was a vertical shaft, so tiny that it was probably difficult to turn around, let alone kneel, sit, or lay down. The term Oubliette comes from the French word oublier, meaning to uh, forget. Oh, you speak French now. They put prisoners down here, in the shaft at the bottom, and forget about them. Also known as a bottle dungeon, this is a basement room accessible only from a hatch or hole in a high ceiling. Wikipedia tells us victims in oubliettes were often left to starve and dehydrate to death. Well, starvation and dehydration affect the body differently over different periods of time. Let's compare. As mentioned previously, a person will die from dehydration within three days. During this time, blood volume decreases, leaving less blood available to deliver oxygen and nutrients to vital organs. If the heart, brain, and lungs, or any other vital organ can't get enough oxygen, they die. And they won't go quietly if you catch my drift. If the jailers decided to provide the prisoners with a little water, the body would last much longer. In a 2009 article, Dr. Pia Kosik wrote, Altogether, it seems possible to survive without food and drink within a time span of 8 to 21 days. So let's consider what starvation actually is. Yeah, that brother's starving. Yes, sir, brother. <laughs> Initially, the body uses stored energy sources like glycogen and fat to generate energy required for vital processes. As time passes, it starts breaking down its own proteins, including muscle tissue, leading to muscle wasting and weakness, among other things. The body is forced to consume its own tissue in order to survive. Metabolic processes slow down, immune function weakens, and multiple organ systems can fail. Death usually occurs due to heart failure, organ failure, or severe infections. With a little food and water, the torturers can really manipulate the anatomy of their victims and prolong an already unbearable stay. Some prisoners were left there for weeks as they were periodically thrown a little food and water. And just wait till we talk about the other accommodations. Many were underground, making them a dungeon within a dungeon, meaning that all the water and detritus from everywhere else would seep in. Added moisture, free of charge. For prolonged guests at Hotel Oubliette, we really need to consider the implications of environmental conditions such as these, as they would contribute to the possibility of infection. Moisture itself won't directly increase the risk of infection, but it can create conditions that promote the growth of bacteria 
fungi and other microorganisms that may lead to infections or exacerbate existing ones. A stone dungeon in the basement of a large castle would also be fairly cold. And even if the temperature is not sufficient to cause hypothermia, Perpetual stress from suboptimal temperature can weaken the immune system's ability to fight off infections. Worst still, in some cases, a prisoner may have been possibly standing on the rotting corpse or bones of the last unfortunate guest. Even if the jailers removed the corpse of the previous tenant, I doubt they would have cleaned out the bodily waste products inevitably produced during their stay. Somehow, the probability of infection is climbing higher still. You may also recall when our guest professor Medieval Madness pointed out that the oubliette was too narrow to kneel, sit, or even lie down. Where do we even begin? As the muscles fatigue and weaken due to constant use without adequate rest, the body begins to lean and chafe against unforgiving stone walls. Under the conditions we've described, even a scratch in a small, barely accessible space is liable to progress into a serious infection. Standing for prolonged periods of time has several other health risks that must also be addressed. Edema refers to the overaccumulation of fluid in the body's tissue and can occur as a result of the effects of gravity on the circulatory system. In the upright position, blood has to work against gravity to return to the heart, particularly from the lower extremities. Over time, with the body positioned upright for a prolonged period, blood return to the heart is compromised, thereby increasing pressure in tiny blood vessels called capillaries in the legs, leading to leakage of fluid from blood vessels to the surrounding tissue. Furthermore, you may also be surprised to learn that the leg muscles provide an important pump action to help recirculate venous blood to the heart against the influence of gravity. In particular, the calf muscles, soleus and the gastrocnemius, known by some specialists as the second heart, play an integral role in this function. But if the legs can't move, just like the damp conditions of the oubliette, edema does not directly cause infection, but it definitely creates conditions that increase the risk. Swollen, warm tissue could be more prone to a bacterial or fungal overgrowth, and as tissue continues to swell and distort, it is prone to fissures or cracking, leaving the door wide open for whatever is festering on the dungeon floor. Stagnant fluid is an excellent medium in which bacterial cells can multiply, while the swelling may also impede blood circulation and the immune cells it typically delivers. The list goes on, but I'm certain you're beginning to get the idea. The longer a prisoner stays in the oubliette, the greater the likelihood of infection. And if infection strikes in the deep, dank darkness of the oubliette, sepsis is inevitable. This occurs when the body's response to an infection becomes dysregulated and leads to widespread inflammation. And next time the torturer throws the daily ration of bread against the oubliette wall, the lonely sound falls on dead ears. Literally. Many who were thrown in this brutal pit would never see the light of day again. Would you believe me if I said it gets worse? The oubliette at Leap Castle in Ireland has spikes in the floor just for a little more added suffering. Told you. Five star accommodations. For those lucky enough to have survived their allotted sentence, I'm sure they'll thoroughly enjoy the next opportunity they have to take a seat. Unless, of course, it's a torture chair, or what we might call a cradle of pain. Fresh out of the frying pan, into the fire. Whoo! I mean, compared to the oubliette, a weary prisoner might be inclined to take a seat on one of these babies, spikes and all. At least the torture chair wasn't designed as a method of execution. Someone could indeed make it out of the chair, although they were likely to be severely injured after their extremely uncomfortable sit down. That's because the spikes attached to the chair's many surfaces were designed only to puncture surface tissue, thus avoiding major arteries and vital organs. Generally speaking, major arteries are located deeper within the body, protected by layers of tissues, including muscles and other structures. This positioning helps shield arteries from external trauma. The arterial 
vesicles and capillaries, smaller arteries that branch off of larger arteries to supply specific regions, including musculature and skin with blood, won't be so lucky. Once a prisoner is strapped into the chair and the torturer begins to tighten the straps. If the person was tied tighter to the chair during the interrogation, the spikes would pierce flesh and soon the person would be oozing blood all over their body. Depending on the chair's design, we're talking about 1,500 or so spikes, many shallow wounds all pointing in the direction of hemorrhagic shock. Interestingly, however, so long as the prisoner is immobilized by the straps in the chair, these spikes, especially those of a thicker variety as pictured here, would plug their wounds to some degree, temporarily reducing blood loss. But if the prisoner moves around or shifts weight in their seat, all bets are off. To make things even worse, sometimes fire or hot coals would be put underneath the chair. Of course they did. Probably pretty hard to sit still with a fire raging beneath your seat. Every time there is movement, there is a potential for a new wound. And I doubt these contraptions were cleaned very often, meaning each wound is an opportunity for bacteria on the chair to enter the body. Since sepsis is what happens when a localized infection becomes widespread, all it takes is for one of the many wounds to become infected, and then for that infection to overwhelm the immune system. Yeah, about that. Unfortunately, the moment the prisoner is removed from the chair and the blood gates are open, their immune system would be in a compromised state. Medical intervention is essential to address the bleeding and restore blood volume to support the immune system and prevent complications. But middle-aged medical care was limited, to say the least, especially for prisoners or criminals. The Chinese had a slightly different version of the torture chair, and it consisted of mainly 12 large spikes or blades around the device. Because where spikes don't cut it, a series of sword-like blades will do the trick. This thing looks like a hungry animal, and those blades look to be at least one and a half inches in width, even longer along the length of the arms. Depending on how sharp the blades were, this chair would be far more destructive than the European counterpart. In both cases, prisoners run the risk of infection, but here, blood loss and tissue damage would likely be worse. Dr. A. Chimay tells us in an article entitled The History of Flexor Tendon Surgery that since the Renaissance, surgeons have attempted to repair flexor tendon injuries, but without success due to problems related to unsuitable materials and ignorance of the basic rules of asepsis and the absence of antiseptics until the second half of the 19th century. The first successful flexor tendon grafts in man were performed by K. Bozalski in 1910, E. Lexer in 1912, and L. Meyer in 1916. So a trip to the Chinese torture chair all but guarantees a permanent physical disability. And any medieval doctor promising the successful repair of a severed tendon or ligament is actually promising sepsis and possibly death. If they did not comply, their bodies would be fastened tighter to the chair and pain would ensue. I'm particularly concerned about the blades on the footrest as the various connected tissues on the bottom of the foot that are crucial for foot movement and function are relatively close to the surface. The plantar fascia, for example, is a thick band of tissue that runs along the bottom of the foot, connecting the heel to the toes. While not a tendon, it plays a critical role in supporting the arch of the foot and assisting with walking and running. The flexor tendons run along the bottom of the foot and are responsible for curling the toes downward, or flexion. There are multiple flexor tendons, each serving a specific toe. These tendons work together to control various movements of the foot, allowing us to walk, run, jump, and perform other activities that require mobility and stability in the foot and ankle. I'm also concerned about the blades digging into the bottom of the thighs, as the tendons and ligaments are associated with the knee joint and the muscles of the hamstrings are located there. Feel along the underside of your leg while flexing your knee and you'll feel them. Sad little gazelles trapped in the mouth of a predator. These tendons can kiss their rolls in knee flexion and hip extension goodbye. And depending on the extent of the damage, the prisoner may never walk again. 
Let me know down in the comments what types of torture you'd like to see me talk about next. What? We've got a lot more ground to cover since it seems humans have no shortage of imagination when causing each other pain. Remember to check out my online gym, Human 2.0 Fitness, for free right here on YouTube, where we help you move better and prevent injury. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.